I was born the fourth child of my parents in 1936 in a town is Székesfehérvár. It is uh, an old city of Hungary. I thought that life was easy and good. Uh, and so it was for my parents and my siblings. But then uh, Second World War has come to our threshold. He grew up in a family that was upper middle class. So his, his mother's side of the family ran what we would call a large department store. They lost all of that in the war. They became refugees, struggling to live, struggling to eat, struggling to have a shelter, literally a shelter um, in which to, to live. My parents learned to live their faith much more vividly in those bad years. And I learned to go to daily mass, if that there was a chance for it, uh, with my mother, uh, and learned really the, the big, big truth about how to trust in God from my father. He went to a Cistercian school for grades five and six. After sixth grade, the Cistercians were banned from the schools in Sheskaveavar and throughout the country. And so for the following two years, some of the eighth grade, he went to a state school in Sheskaveavar. Then following that, the family moved to Budapest. And when they moved to Budapest, they sent Father Dennis to a Benedictine school in Pananoma, which was a very fine boarding school. Eventually, although I wanted to study French, at the university, I was allowed to, law, to enter law school after graduation. Between 1950 and 56, he was an underground seminarian in a sense. Religious orders were banned, and his vocational education was led by Father Lawrence Sigmund, who conducted classes in his home. like a, an unexpected bomb. The, the Hungarian Revolution broke out. October the 23rd, 1956, the students marched on the streets. Very soon, the events have turned into violence. Father Dennis's involvement in the 1956 revolution got captured on a video that was used by Time Life documentary to uh, tell the story of the 1956 revolution. So I left Hungary uh, on the 22nd of November, so almost a full month after the revolution broke out, uh, crossed the border to Austria. There were parts of the border still open where it was as it turned out relatively easy to, to walk across. Uh, I learned from others that it wasn't as easy, but I was lucky I went, I tried the right place. They really escaped. This wasn't, and many of them, I mean, some of the older priests were tortured and whatnot. This was not a, this wasn't a pleasant thing. And so I arrived to Rome a week later and all of a sudden, I was in Rome as a Cistercian studying for the priesthood. For the first time in my life, I was doing what I wanted to do. I got a doctorate in theology in record time, really. At about the same time I arrived to Rome, the initiative of this monastery has taken off. And so, at the invitation of Abbot Anselm, who was the founding prior of this monastery, I came to America in 1962 and started teaching in 1965. At the time when we first arrived at Cistercian in 1965, it was out in the middle of nowhere. It was before 
Texas Stadium existed. It was before State Highway 114 existed. It was before Las Colinas. It was before Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Nobody had any idea where Irving, Texas was. I became a very dedicated teacher. Every day entering the classroom for me was a happy occasion. Here's a guy who did all his scripture study, you know, and was ready to come over here and teach something in theology, perhaps. And he gets here and his abbot at the time says, you will go study mathematics. And in 18 months, not speaking very good English, he goes and gets a master's in mathematics. His passion for math, his ability to, to really uh, inspire the kids to pursue math as an avenue towards God, towards truth, uh, I think speaks volumes in a world in which faith and reason are di you know, diametrically opposed. I, I always preach as if I was teaching math, and I always teach math as if I was preaching. <laughs> I think he shared with all of us that studies well done, uh, academics well done, um, are a way for the human being to become fully himself. It was Christmas done in 68 that I was told that I, I was appointed to be headmaster for the following school year. I was 32 years old at the time. I remained in that position for 12 years. Father Dennis was key to the, the foundation of the school because he is a born leader. And when you have a school that's just getting started, it's imperative that you have an outstanding executive. He brought a certain discipline to the whole administration of the school that didn't exist before. And he stepped into it when the school was in a rocky period of time. And there was question on the inside about whether it could last for long. And he knew what he was taking on. It was really about the survival of the school. He had a vision for the school. He wanted a school that would be small in such a way that each boy would be able to develop to the best of his capacities, but he also wanted it a very academic school. I fostered and developed uh, entrusting a group of boys to a priest at the beginning in the uh, fifth grade and making that priest responsible for the group of boys all the way up to graduation. This system exists up to now, and the idea was we call them the form masters. We now have literally hundreds of graduates who are giving back to the Dallas community, both in their business lives and in working in, with the Catholic Church. There's no question in my mind He's the reason that Cistercian School is where it is, and more importantly, the, C the Cistercian Abbey is. For 24 years, I was abbot of the monastery. And I had, a, had the duty of reorganizing many things in the abbey, but the identity of the monastery could not express itself to the public without the church. Father Dennis believed that if this chapel got built, that it would, it would call to people. Without a doubt, 10 years later, young novices start trickling in. And, and many of those novices are ex-Cistercian students. I have had the privilege to ordain 11 young men to the priesthood. Uh, for the Cistercian Monastery here in Dallas. Today there's 27 monks in the Abbey. 13 of them came, you know, in, during Father Dennis's tenure as abbot. The Hungarians say that the uh, Abbey of Dallas um, has been able to uh, make real the dream of the Abbey of Zirts, uh, from which they came, of being monks and priests and teachers. And Father Dennis's mother, to whom he was particularly close, must just be rejoicing in heaven to see her son make real this dream. There is another side to Father Dennis that most people don't know about. He's written 10 books, eight in Hungarian, and many of those on the Bible. 
He would write articles on the church fathers and the development of the church in the, in the second century, third century. He would participate in a, a ecumenical seminar, uh, and he still participates in that seminar. It was the result of his biblical scholarship that the Vatican named him to the Pontifical Biblical Commission in September 2001. The Pope actually would use this commission as a sounding board for a Catholic Church teaching on the Bible. He was an advisor to John Paul II and to Pope Benedict. Abbot Dennis, to me, is a great example of what a priest should be in this world. The kind of clarity he's had about his own um, life as a, as a Cistercian monk and as a priest and the self-sacrificing character of that life uh, is just uh, intensely meaningful to me. One of the lessons that Father Dennis taught me that remains with me to this day, uh, and it's kind of a small thing, but at the same time very important, and that is that every single person needs encouragement. Whether they be young or old, whatever their, their state in life, everybody needs encouragement. He is all about what's best for everybody else, not what's best for him. And that's, that's fairly unique. He has a knack to be able to sit down, speak with you for really just minutes, and have an incredible understanding of who you are and what motivates you. It's, it's, a, it's a true talent. He's impacted so many countless individuals uh, in helping them discern life choices uh, that we're eternally grateful to him for. He expected so much of us because he expected it of himself. He's one who can just kind of love you without having to be responsible for disciplining at this point. And I think he's, I think he's really relieved at that too. Um, so he doesn't have to worry about the budget in the monastery or the cars or the water breaking down, but he's just able to, um, I think, uh, enjoy the community that he's built over the years. He gave of his enormous talents, abilities, and love for us and should be remembered for that. To have some institution like the Catholic Foundation, which has done so much for the diocese, done so much for the Catholic Church in our area, um, to see them call attention to not the most obvious, but one of the most important and perhaps one of the least known, uh, I think is a tremendous witness to the importance of the monastic life, to the importance of the life of learning in the church, to the importance of the individuals who give themselves in that life and, and faithfully serve other people in so many ways. I know I am who I am today because of the way he cared for us and pushed us and loved us and nurtured us in those formative years. I could never repay him. At an opening mass of a school year, if I sit just in a corner, unknown to most and uh, unrecognized even, I have a happiness that I cannot express. Such a small community as Cistercian, a family of monks surrounded with a family of students, surrounded with families of families. Uh, this is the most solid uh, human institution in the world.